Dear Fox, uh, dear colleagues, it is my great pleasure to discuss uh, today about the treatment landscape of patients with ER positive head to negative metastatic breast cancer. We all know that the field is rapidly evolving, and today we will review the current endocrine treatment options and discuss the key findings from the latest cell group analysis published from the Emerald trial. As we all know, the management of ER positive to negative metastatic breast cancer evolves endocrine treatment plus silica E4 and 6 inhibitors as a clear first line standard of care. However, unfortunately, the great majority of our patients at some time develop resistance. Molecular resistance patterns might include intrinsic alterations, intrinsic mutations many times, basically in the PIK3CA AKT mTOR pathway as the key example, but also some of our patients develop acquired resistance. A common type of acquired resistance is maybe the mutations that might appear in the ESR1 gene. This happens in about 40 to 50% of patients and basically emerge in the metastatic setting for those patients who receive aromatase inhibitors during the first line treatment. Elastostran is a novel therapeutic treatment for patients with ER positive head to negative metastatic breast cancer whose tumors do have that mutation, ESR1. Elastran is the first oral cert which have been approved by both the FDA and the EMEA to patients with this disease according to the positive results from the Emerald study. The Emerald is an open label phase 3 trial randomly assign patients with ER positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer to either Elastran at a dose of 3, 4, 5, 345 milligrams daily or standard of care, either aromatase inhibitors or fulvestran. In this trial, patients were heavily pretreated. Roughly 20% of patients received prior chemotherapy. It was allowed up to one prior line of therapy, of chemotherapy. About 30% of patients received prior lines of endocrine treatment, and which is key for this study, all patients 100% received pre previous treatment with CDK4 and 6-based therapy. The key primary endpoint was progression-free survival assessed in both all patients and also in the ESR1 mutant subgroup of patients. In Emerald, single-agent elastostran significantly prolonged the median progression-free survival from 1.9 months with standard of care to 3.8 months with elastestran and reduced the risk of progression or death by 45% compared with standard of care in those patients whose tumors did have the mutation in the ESR1 gene. It is key to better inform the healthcare professionals in treatment decisions. That's why we looked at the clinically relevant subgroup analysis. The majority of them were conducted post hoc, helping to identify those tumors that remain endocrine sensitive is key despite having had acquired resistance. So dear colleagues, let me analyze a little bit the subgroup analysis. So when we are looking at those patients who did not receive prior chemotherapy, Elastran clearly again significantly improved progression-free survival, median PFS 5.32 months compared with 1.91 months, which means a 46 reduction in the risk of progression or death with elastran compared with standard of care. However, for me, the key subgroup analysis is analyzing the duration of prior CDK4 and 6 inhibitors. Again, elastran progression-free survival was clearly better compared with standard of care Basically, in those patients who were on treatment with CDK for at least 12 months, the median PFS here was 8.6 months with less strand, which clearly was superior compared with standard of care. What about other subgroup analysis? As we all know, sometimes it happens the coexistence of pic 3 ca mutations and ESR1 in the range of 15 to 30%. In this group of patients with at least 12 months of endocrine treatment plus CDK4 and 6 inhibitors, 12 months or higher, commutations, median PFS, 5.5 months, which indicates that in this group, 
again, the tumor remains estrogen receptor driven. Finally, other subgroup analysis, regardless the number and sites of metastasis, regardless the ESR1 variants, regardless P53 or HER2 expression, again, Elastran behaves better compared with standard of care. What about safety? The safety analysis demonstrated that Elastran had a manageable safety profile similar to other endocrine treatments. And it is key to remark that this is without the evidence of toxicity that sometimes appears when we combine endocrine treatment with different targeted agents. For Elastran, in the overall population, the great majority of adverse events were grade 1 or grade 2. Treatment-related adverse events leading to discontinuations were in the range of 3.4%. The most common all-grade gastrointestinal adverse events observed were nausea, grade 3 in 2.5% compared with 0.9% with standard of care, and vomiting, 0.8%. It is remarkable to add that no patients experienced grade 4 nausea or vomiting with the last So let me go back to the clinic. For patients with ER positive HER2 negative, ESR1 mutated metastatic breast cancer, who had disease progression on prior endocrine treatment plus CDK4 and CC inhibitors, which are the options we might have? Endocrine treatment, monotherapy, continuation of endocrine treatment plus CDK4 and CC inhibitor, PIC3CA, AKT mTOR, signaling pathway inhibitors plus endocrine treatment. But we should not forget that all these therapies are associated with shorter progression free survival in those patients who received previous treatment with CDK4 and CC inhibitors, and even more so in ESR1 mutant tumors. But what about safety? Fulvestran, for example, is associated with adverse events, including injection site pain. CDK4 and CC inhibitor combinations are associated with neutropenia, leukemia, anemia, diarrhea, thermobolic events sometimes, and discontinuations do happen due to adverse events in up to 19% of patients. The use of pic 3 ca aqt mtor signaling pathway inhibitors with endocrine therapy are associated with diarrhea, rash, hyperglycemia, and this results in discontinuations roughly in the range of 24% of patients. So now, when, what, and how to test ESR1 mutations? According to the key, the most important guidelines worldwide, we know that the longer exposure to endocrine treatment in metastatic breast cancer increases the chance of developing these mutations during treatment, and about 40 to 50% of patients could have these mutations. This is one. The recommendations include to test ESR1 mutations after progression to first-line treatment via liquid biopsy because of the subclonality of these mutations. If negative, repeat it at each progression. We should avoid the use of archival tissue because as we said before, these mutations is acquired and might occur, might happen during the course of the disease after previous treatments.